afternoon, evening. So we're going to be recording this meeting. So the meeting right now, we're gonna start Wednesday, April 21st, and we're starting at 6.04. There are five commissioners and with more than five, we have a quorum and can go ahead with our meeting. The quorum for the meeting uh, is a five or more. Here we have myself, Tim Riker. I will be doing the moderating as the chair for the meeting. We also have Caroline Obrick. She is the vice chair. We also have Betsy Beach, who is our secretary. She is here. And we have Brett Hayes. He is the treasurer. And uh, lastly, we have Tina Nelson. She is also here. I believe that is our total of the five commissioners. There may be more who are coming a little bit late, but we will go ahead and get started. We also have some staff who are here. We have Ernest Covington III, and he is the executive director. We have Bethany Blank, and she is responsible for doing some of the admin and tech of this particular meeting. We also have Christine West, she is responsible for the coordinating of the Healthcare System Transformation Project, the HSTP. And we have Lindsay Conway. She is a contractor who is working with the commission. Um, looking here on the list to see if I missed anyone else. I'm not seeing anyone. We have um, two interpreters and a CART provider as well. So the Rhode Island Commission has a very strong policy and belief that our meetings should be inclusive for anyone to be able to visually access um, in a sign language or uh, subtitles, captions in any way that they need. And if you need the captions, you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a symbol for live transcript. And then you can move around on the screen where you prefer. And there will always be an interpreter as well on the screen. We ask in the meeting that we have a max of four videos open because when we're recording it later, we want to make sure that um, none of the videos are hard to see because of that. So we ask that people close their video so that there is always a max of only four people on screen. When the meeting gets started, then we will have the meeting, but we also want to open it up for public comment. If anyone is here for public comment, then you can at that point uh, make a, a brief comment during that time. Uh, but for the rest of the meeting, uh, we do not have to accept public comments, but if you would like to make a comment, you can send a message in the chat uh, to myself and ask for uh, to when there would be time. And if there is enough time, we would recognize that comment to be made in the other times of the meeting. Um, we're going to follow the agenda and uh, open up for public comment as the agenda mentions. If there's no one that's looking for public comment at this time, then we can move ahead with the agenda. Okay, now we can see that our agenda is shared and there is a full agenda this evening. There's a lot of information here. So we wanna move ahead and make sure we can finish at least most of what's on the agenda. There are a few points on the agenda that um, might have some uh, greater discussion. Okay, can you all see me? Okay, so you'll see the agenda on the screen here. And we also will have a time for reading the minutes from February 17th and March 17th. So those two months um, from those two meetings that we had. We're going to share those minutes and let everyone take a chance to look at them. If there's any edits or comments, then someone will make a motion uh, to accept the minutes at that point. 
Then there's a few other items are on our agenda after that. Thank you. Great, great. Okay, so I think at this point we are ready to pull up the February 17th minutes and we can share those on the screen now. You need a minute. I need um, to collect the minutes. Just one moment. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and wait. We also now have uh, Boonmi who has joined the meeting. So we currently have six commissioners present now and uh, there might be some more that will come later. Boonmi Osho. We're waiting at this point to find the minutes so that they can be shared on the screen. And then at that point, we'd be able to, oh, here they are, we found them. Great. Does anyone have any motion or suggestion of edits and or would you like to make a motion for us to accept the minutes? I, Tina? I make a motion to accept the February 17th minute. Okay, does anyone uh, second that motion? Caroline Albrecht, I second it. Okay, Carolyn Obrick has voiced that she is seconding the motion. All in favor, do you accept the minutes? Go ahead and give a thumbs up, turn your video on. I think, okay, we see Boonmi as well. Brett? So we have five in favor, but waiting for a vote from Brett. Okay, we can go ahead and count five. Oh, Brett also accepts. Okay, so it is all, all of the present commissioners six. Next, uh, that was the March 17th minutes. Can we pull those up as well? I guess they're gone. Okay. Oh, 
Give me one moment, I apologize, one second. Okay. Betsy? You're muted, Betsy? Mute. Okay, I had written down last time that we accepted the minutes, I believe, from 217. So I think we only have one um, set of minutes to accept tonight. I have that in my notes, and it's probably in the transcript. I can double check with the transcript. Because it, you know, this. this okay. This, well, I guess we've double approved them then at this point. So really covering our bases. Better, basis. better than not approving. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Okay. Does anyone have any suggested edits or a motion for us to accept the minutes? I move that we accept the minutes as written. This is Tina Nelson. I okay. will second it. Okay. Tina has uh, verbally given a second. So uh, all in favor, please show a thumbs up with your video on. Okay, uh, no oppose. All right, then the minutes have been accepted. So our process, we want to make sure that we give this information on time to the community. So our monthly minutes, we have a first draft. If it hasn't been approved yet, it would be posted. And then once they're um, approved at the meeting, then at that point, we go ahead and public post them more publicly with a final approval. So we're gonna try to make that fast. Okay, so moving on from there, we have a couple of short things to say. So right now across the US and also globally, there are a number of issues going on, skirmishes and other things like that. And here in the United States, there has been a number of uh, black people who have been killed by police officers. And there has been some uh, a recent announcement about Derek Chauvin, the police officer who was charged with three counts and was found guilty on all three and is now currently awaiting sen sentencing for how long that uh, prison sentence would be. So recognizing that he has been found guilty, we know that that is not the end of this road and there's going to be and has been more incidences that have come up. And at the Rhode Island Commission, we are always wanting to look at and recognize any need of anything that needs to be approached and solved when it comes to inequity, whether it's with, regarding race or any other differences that people have. And in Rhode Island, we want it to be a safe and equitable place for people to live. For the Rhode Island and for the deaf and hard of hearing, deaf blind, late deafened, for this community, we want to recognize the diversity in people. And also, from this time on, as any incidences come up, we want to be prepared if there is important information that happens, that
that we make sure that information is readily accessible to the community so that all people will receive the information at an equitable time, as close to the same time as possible. And in the future, the Rhode Island Commission wants to continue to do research and discuss the different ways that issues like this can be addressed. Thank you. Now we want to go ahead and I'm going to turn this over to Ernest Covington, uh, the executive director for his report. And I'm going to ask uh, it to be uh, at the max five minutes because we have a number of things on the agenda. 15. So max 15 minutes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me turn my video off. Ernest is saying. <clears throat> Hello, and I have three things that I want to briefly talk about. I know Tim asked us to be very succinct. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the work that Bethany, Lindsay, Pam, Mike, and Holly have done about vaccinations, about making sure that we have communication access, that we have interpreters provided at the vaccination sites, there's signage posted. So I wanted to tell people there's good news we have been approved that on May 1st, we will have on-site interpreters and FEMA, uh, and also, um, excuse me, virtual, the ability to be able to, I'm trying to think there's three things. So live interpreters on site at different sites on May 1st, the Sakonesset site, the state-run vaccination site in Cranston, Rhode Island. And there's a scheduled time between nine and four. We'll have a private link that we will email out to deaf and hard of hearing people only who can then sign up for our vaccinations. There are 50 slots available, 50. <clears throat> And it has to be between nine and four to access the on-site interpreters. You can obviously go to another place, FEMA Rhode Island or other places before or after nine o'clock at Sakonasset, after four o'clock. But if you want an on-site live interpreter, that is the time. We'll send out information to the deaf and hard of hearing communities with a private link and they can sign up. We'll send that out on Friday and they can sign up for the May 1st, but again, 50 slots is the limit. The commission has been working with the department to try to get new signage to show deaf and hard of hearing people what to do when they get onto the site, that there is VRI and that there is also captioning and so that all of that will be communication access for deaf people and when they come in that'll help them register it'll help them answer the questions for the vaccination and after they finish being vaccinated they go into the observation area and they're there for 15 minutes and people are going to ask about their status so all of those different ways of communicating will be allowed to them the fema vri the captioning Sakin Asset has that, that's the state-run vaccine site. They have access with the extra signage, with captioning, with VRI. So you can definitely use that. They will have screens set up, femavri.com. And there's an app that you could set up on your own phone or use the link. And an interpreter will appear through remote interpreting. throughout the entire process from registration to the actual vaccine to the after time observation. We want people to be able to have communication access even if they, there is no on-site live interpreter. 
The process takes anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes. And this way you can have BRI through this FEMA BRI.com. So as of May 1st, that May 1st is the only date we have on-site interpreters. Once those 50 slots are filled, it's possible they'll come up with another site and another day. And I think that also depends on how many deaf people try to get through the link. We do not want people who are not deaf signing up that day because we want to make sure that that time is dedicated to deaf and hard of hearing people who can access and benefit from the on-site interpreter. We've worked really hard to make sure that this is effective and that the information is out there. And we're very, very grateful that this is finally coming to pass. So May 1st is a huge event. The second thing is the FY22 budget. We're coming to the end of June. We only have two more months for this budget year and the new fiscal year starts on July 1st. So we have to move fast with our budget plans. Hopefully we'll get the state to approve an increase so that we can have a fifth FDE. We are looking for $80,000 and I don't know if they'll approve it or if they'll keep us level funded, but if they do increase the funding, we might be able to add another staff person. So they have two options and we don't know which way it's going to go. But we do have the CARES, the relief money that has come down to the state from the federal government. And there will be also matching funds. Those are related to, they have to be related to COVID-19 and COVID-19 relief and recovery. It is possible that the timeline will be extended, but right now there's a deadline of June 30th. Once FY21 is over, those funds won't be able to be used. That's at least at this point. So we're starting to plan for FY22. The third thing I wanted to speak about, the Hearing Loss Awareness Month with Pam Zellner, I wanted to thank you for your work. Starting in May, please keep your eyes uh, open for different events that are happening during the month, Hearing, Aid, Hearing Awareness Month. We're gonna be providing different discussion groups to help explain more about different issues how to keep safe from COVID-19, mental health issues. I wanted to thank Caroline Obrecht and Drew Balsley for these topics about um, treatment for mental health issues and therapy, both for deaf and hard of hearing people. And we're going to be setting up a panel with different panelists who are audiologists and they will be speaking about, they all have different backgrounds. They work with uh, deaf or hard of hearing people. There are people who themselves are um, BIPOC people, audiologists from different backgrounds, people who themselves have hearing loss and we can talk about what their policies are, ask them questions about how they run their business. So far we have two Rhode Island audiologists, I think two or three. And then we have other audiologists joining the, the panel from other states. We want to keep a good balance. But Pam told me that she is looking to find a Black audiologist. And it isn't easy. But we finally did find somebody. And we're trying to get that person to come on board. I think they're in Florida. It'd be very, very nice to have that diversity and to have somebody with BIPOC on that panel. Very often we see the same people again and again, and this would be exciting to see 
a group of audiologists with such diversity, especially for Hearing Loss Awareness Month. So we're looking forward to different events that are happening over the month. Please spread the word among your communities to check Facebook and to check our website to see when these events will occur, when we'll have the panel. We'll be putting out more information in our newsletters if people are interested in the topics. And also Betsy Beach, I saw you open up your, your uh, screen. You're gonna be mediating the panel, is that correct, Betsy? Moderating. Yes, I am gonna be moderating. And um, Pam worked diligently on this. And we at one point we did have a black audiologist from Rhode Island um, that we were inviting, but I think that they could not um, make the time that we set. It's actually my audiologist, Rachel Timmons. Um, so, you know, we'll go with who we got. And I'm looking forward to it. I think we're we're recording that uh, tomorrow. Yes. That's excellent. I'm I'm excited about it too. As we've known for quite a while. People very often think RICDHH is too favoring of the deaf and not as much a part of hearing people. And we want to make sure that we are uh, representing senior citizens who've lost their hearing, deaf blind people, late deaf and people, hard of hearing people from all different walks of life. And um, the legislature week, we're still working on legislative week. We have not at this point decided on a date. It's very difficult right now working with the legislators. That's my report. I'll give it back to Tim. Thank you so much for your attention. Tim saying, thank you, Ernest. That was succinct. Thank you very much. And before I go on, I wanted to ask if there's any questions from the report that Ernest just gave. And if not, I'll move on to another topic. Uh, we have committee reports. Any questions for Ernest? If not, I'll move on. Very good. The agenda lists them in a certain order, so I'll follow that as well. The Education Committee. I'm involved with that. And I know that tomorrow, Thursday, April 22nd, we have our next meeting scheduled, and that's at 4.30. 430. Yes, we are going to be inviting Margaret Malloy. She's at OSIL, the Ocean State Independent Living Center. And we're inviting her because we want her to present about the services that OSIL provides and how they support the folks that they work with, what people need from them. The education committee is in the process right now of inviting different people from independent living centers. We're thinking about moving forward on establishing a nonprofit organization or something which would provide more advocacy to a, um, an adult ed services to the deaf community and the hard of hearing community here in the state. And we know that some of the things are overlapping with other agencies with the services. Some are duplicated, some we don't have. We don't have services for deaf blind people. So if we established something that would help immigrants, deaf blind people, different groups who are underserved and we could identify the needs and provide more resources for them. Betsy, you um, opened your screen for a second. Did you have a comment? That was a mistake. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay. I'll go on to the next committee. Employment. And I don't know, Betsy, are you on that? I think so. Yes, I'm on the employment committee. Uh, we meet again uh, next week. We've had one meeting um, 
since uh, the commission last met and we meet again next Wednesday. Um, we're working on a presentation that will be part of Hearing Loss Awareness Month. It will be um, the last week of May and um, we are recruiting role models who are successful in their workplaces um, to be on a panel and to talk about how they've been able to, you know, figure out the access they need and um, get the training they need and how they cope at work. So we're hoping that um, this is a, just a very encouraging um, presentation and that people will be inspired by the people that will be speaking. Um, mostly that's what we're working on. Um, I think the other things are um, hoping to set up a, a LinkedIn uh, profile for our committee, um, which LinkedIn has to do with um, it's social media um, that will help people link into different employers. Um, and I think also potentially a Facebook page about employment available in Rhode Island for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, but the, the main thing we've been working on is uh, this role model panel. Thank you so much, Betsy, for that report. Any questions for Betsy about employment? If not, we can move forward. We have healthcare systems transformation, HSTP, and also the healthcare committee. I think Brett Hayes, if you would like to make a comment or a report about the meetings with healthcare, Uh, um, yeah, so we had a most recent healthcare committee meeting uh, earlier this month. I want to say the 8th. Um, can't remember the exact date, but we used the time to get together to talk about uh, the survey results that uh, Christine and her team had put out um, working with Gallaudet and they put out surveys to all um, healthcare employees and um, it, it was pretty insightful and it, it, was, it was good to see the responses that we got from the healthcare community talking about uh, if they understand what kind of asset the deaf and hard of hearing community is, should be available to have. And, um, it, and there were just so many results that we weren't able to get through it. Um, but it, we got a really good summary of it and it was really exciting to see the fruit of the labor of the HFTP project team working so hard through all of this and getting all of the survey results um, working with Gallaudet. Um, so that's kind of where we stand now and um, we'll likely schedule another meeting for May, um, we just have we don't have a concrete date as of right now. I don't think I've reached out to the team yet. Um, so that, that's where we are right now with the healthcare committee. And uh, just to add one more thing, is, um, I know that we want to get back to talking with Dr. Marie Lynch uh, from Rhode Island College about the interpreter program at the in their continuing education department. Uh, so that's something that we'll probably talk more about in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks, Brett, for that report. Okay. And do we have any questions? Uh, then if no questions, then we'll move on from there. I think the next thing we have Ernest who is working on the tech access and the TRS. That um, trans relay service. 
I know, do we have any more recent information to share with us? Yes, yes. Yes, so I have good news on this front. I've already reached out to the other committee, the ATL Access Tech and the ATTL, and we've asked for uh, some discussions with them on their resources about the relay service committee and about trying to split the responsibilities to the two. And the ATTL committee so far, all of that information they've gone through and their goals and the goals that we had, we discussed splitting them. And so there were four people who were interested in joining the relay committee and their names. I'm going to give you the specific topics as well, but Public Utility Committee, Rudolf Sokolny, and the next there's a public seat, and Dennis, Denise Corson will have that. Um, and another person who is interested Michelle Vicano, she's hard of hearing and she works with uh, the telephone company as a customer service. Um, she works with people throughout Rhode Island and she uh, knows this information well. And there was one more seat as well. Um, it was a, a seat for a hard of hearing person who does not use sign language. And it was for Christine and Constantio. Uh, Constantio, I believe. Um, so those are the people who are interesting and in, interested in joining that. And so we have three also who are available for commissioners as well. So we're required to have three. One is for a deaf commissioner who signs. Another one is for a hard of hearing commissioner. And the third was for a hearing commissioner. So if any of the commissioners are interested in joining this committee, then we would have a full board of seven on the committee because the other four are already, uh, those seats are taken. So we just need three commissioners to fill that committee and then the board, the committee would be full. So once we have approved that, then we will send that information to Denise, who they'll soon will be an ATTL meeting and we'd let them know the committee is full. And then at that point, we would uh, explain a specific date about this change and there would be an hour of the ATTL committee. And once that committee is done, then the people who are not involved in the next committee would leave and the second hour would be another committee meeting uh, sharing some people. So for me, it seemed that there was a lot of people and we wanted to save time and not duplicate work. And so it seemed to be best to set up um, meetings at the same time. So when the ATTL committee was done, um, then we would take from, uh, the, the next hour. So it would be until nine and then we would go from nine on. So thank you very much. That's the report. Uh, and any of the commissioners who are interested, we need three to join the uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernest. I do have one question for you. Do all three seats have to be commissioners? One deaf, one hard of hearing and one other commissioner? One deaf commissioner, one hard of hearing, and one hearing commissioner. You need one of one of each. Oh, hmm. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So, and the next. She's not the chair of the committee, but we're going to ask Tina to give a very short report. I know you've only had one meeting but it's the Ad Hoc Interpreter Referral Committee. Can you just give a brief report, whatever you have? 
Um, as you said, we only met once. Uh, our second meeting is actually tomorrow night. Um, and so the first night we just met each other and introduced all of the new members of the committee. Ernest reviewed the uh, policies and procedures of the commission and also information about how to how an ad hoc committee is set up by state law. And we started to discuss what we needed to look into in our second meeting. So we have gotten materials to review and those discussions will happen tomorrow. Thank you. Great. So those are all five of our committees. We have all of those reports. Um, yes, Betsy. Um, just a question for Ernest. Can you send me the names and the spellings and the employers of the people that are interested in the tech access committee? Because otherwise I won't get them right for the minutes. I need you to send me an email with the names. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Great. So we've finished all the committee reports. Are there any other questions at this point? If not, then we will move forward and we would be finished with old business. Move on to any unfinished business. So we do have a very short update. Some of you may remember that we have previously approved the executor, executive director's evaluation process. And we have been trying to contact the Rhode Island Department of Administration and reaching out to them a number of times to set up um, a, they have an online system that state employees are evaluated with. Um, we've reached out to them a number of times and have not had a response. So this project was delayed for a while. Um, it seems that that communication was not being successful. So since that wasn't working, we uh, started talking with some other state agencies that recommended that we don't have to follow the state system and that we can actually use our own system, whether it's pen and paper, or any other to move ahead with that evaluation. So before jumping ahead, I wanted to reach out to a lawyer that worked with the state of Rhode Island and as commissioners and wanted to be sure whether Open Meetings Act, the OMA, um, how we could, how do we store those records? How do we go through this process? And wanted to clarify that process. So, when she once she responds, then we'd know how to move ahead with some of the other lawyers looking at that information and that response should come soon. So that is the most recent update that I have and I'm hoping maybe at our next meeting, we'll be able to announce next steps on that evaluation. Um, so it seems at this point, the Rhode Island state system they have their own online evaluation system, but if it's okay for us to move on without that system, then we don't have to continue to wait for that communication to work out. So hopefully before our next meeting, we'll have worked that out and have something set up. So that is the information that I wanted to share most recently on that. So I think the next would be uh, B, which is related to our legislative week. Uh, I know Ernest, um, he's been working with Pam and trying to establish a legislative week and with the executive director's report mentioned that, but is there anything you want to say additionally? Yes. So thank you. I want to say thank you to Pam and also to Lindsay Conway as well. Um, I believe Lindsay, she could give an explanation of what happens, what's going on with legislative week and all the work that's been going on and trying to work things out with legislators. It's been difficult to do that, um, to talk to the legislators. Uh, Lindsley, do you mind uh, turning on your video and giving that report? I think Lindsay's here. Yeah, I do see that she's here. Hi. If you don't mind giving a report about legislative week and where things are at. Yeah, sure. So Pam and I have been working to try to nail down a date for legislative week. Um, we have Senator Gallo confirmed. Um, we're thinking 
the last week of April, which is already next week, um, or possibly the first week of May. Um, Representative Handy has proven to be much more challenging to um, commit to a date. So uh, it's possible that Gallo is the only speaker that we'll have, um, but his secretary has actually been super helpful in putting us in touch with um, some other possible presenters. But as it stands right now, um, Pam and I are thinking either at the end of April, so next week or early May to have that presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, thank you very much. That's that's the information for Legislative Week. So we're still in process of putting that together. Yes, thank you. Uh, so moving on to C, talking about the introductions of the different legislative organizations and agencies uh, in the process of bills. I know as Rhode Island commissioners, we have not proposed a bill this year, but I know that there are other commissioners, uh, whether it's the Commission on Disabilities or others that have had something that would impact the deaf and hard of hearing community in some way or would be of interest to the community. So Ernest, I believe that you have a list of bills that have been presented that you would like to share. Yes, yes, I would like to share them. Bethany, do you mind sharing that? Let's make that a little bit larger for people to read, maybe a little bit visually larger. If the printing is too small to read at this point. A little bit larger, please. Perfect, great, thank you. Okay, so I've received this information from uh, the legislative letters uh, updates on various bills. And I looked through them and there were a few that um, impact people with disabilities or also focus specifically on something that would interest the deaf and hard of hearing community. So, so the first ones are more hot topics that the legislators are going to be discussing. And HB 5394 is the preservation of families with disabled parents. It's uh, an interesting topic. And the goal is to protect um, parental rights of those with disabilities. And um, it, it would happen at some point that there might be um, some abuse or neglect for, for children, but it cannot only be solely on the basis of a disability that the children would be taken away from the parents. Um, and that the parents would keep custody of children unless there is specific harm or neglect to a child. They can't remove a child from the custody of a parent simply because someone has a disability, they're deaf or hard of hearing and have child removed solely on that basis. So that's one of the bills. Um, and then there's a house vote. Uh, hold on, hold on just a second there. Hold on, hold on. Uh, there's a house vote uh, recently on the 15th, and the next step was that the Senate would vote. That's where that process is. So moving on to the next one now, um, Senate 0457. This one specifically focuses on second languages uh, in education. And the legislature is working on requiring that there be funding for schools and colleges to receive to establish the need for more staff or more resources in order to have access to various languages. So 
So it explains that there would be various languages, which would include modern languages, classical languages, American Sign Languages listed, as well as some Native American Sign Languages, American Native American languages. So it's very all encompassing of world languages that the legislator is working on uh, providing funding to schools and colleges to be able to hire teachers and establish the resources needed to make that happen. And the action taken, there was nothing on the 15th. Can you go down further? Hold on there. Um, this is H5989. Um, this one I thought was interesting, um, but there was a discussion on this about the whether vaccines would be mandatory. And the decision was that it was not legal to make it mandatory and that people would have to have vaccination. It was still an optional choice and that people would not be discriminated against based on the fact that they did not have vaccination. So if someone was not vaccinated, they couldn't um, be fired or something to that extent. So just thought I would mention this as a thought um, that people cannot be told, it would be illegal if they are told since you don't have the vaccination, that there would be a requirement for vaccination. It was still optional. So this was an interesting bill I wanted to add for you to see. And then and on the 16th, it said that no action was taken. So I'm further down, moving down. Okay, so this one would be the Senate 0543. And this one was regarding the Open Meeting Act. So this was about uh, open meetings amendments and uh, making sure that there was enough time for meetings to be set so that people could figure out um, other information, recognize information ahead of time to know about any closed meetings and also to provide enough time for people who are scheduling interpreters for meetings or to make sure that there's access to a meeting. So for example, this meeting, we've established in this meeting, we need to make sure there are interpreters in CART. And so we would need to ask for more time in order to establish that. And this would try to give us some more leeway with time to make sure we had reasonable access for all of the people who need it according to Open Meeting Act. So I thought this would, would be something that would impact us as we're often scheduling interpreters in CART. And Bethany does a great job doing that early and setting that schedule early on. Um, so we don't have an issue with this currently, but if it was something that was to come up in the future and we needed to extend some time for the purpose of providing access with interpreters in CART, um, this bill would impact that. So moving on from there, um, oh, there's two more. So House 5605 and House 6217. Um, this one focuses specifically on the Rhode Island people who have dis scholarship for those who have disabilities, whether they're trying to go to school or college, the Rhode Island legislature wants to establish a scholarship that would particularly help them be successful in a more equitable fashion. So they're trying to work through the funding and to be able to, to convince more to uh, reach higher for education. And in Rhode Island, it's one of the highest places in the US for unemployment. And often that is related to disability unemployment being a very high percentage. So Rhode Island wants to establish this program to give incentive and assistance to those with disabilities to get scholarships and access to college or technical schools to advance their careers and become um, really invest in more of the citizens of Rhode Island. So this bill is assisting in that for those with disabilities to have scholarships. Um, Rhode Island Hope would be the, the name of it. And, and there's one Rhode Island Promise. So looking at this, 
right now is the week of recess for legislature. So next week, the legislature starts again. So I will get more, any more updates on these within the next week. And of course, I can't email at them, but we will definitely share about these with you at the next committee, commissioner meeting. Thank you. I think that's it for me regarding the legislative report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So do we have any questions or I So Tim's repeating with the interpretation. Are there any questions about the reports we've just had about the legislative bills and um, the, the information that we just shared about the evaluation of the executive director? At this point, we still need to make a decision about how we're going to go forward as far as the additional FTE that we're looking for. And what our position at the Rhode Island Commission will be on any of these bills that are coming up. And Betsy, did you have, did you have, I saw you. I was just going to start a discussion. I think the bills about access are important and at either this meeting or the next meeting, we should talk about trying to support them. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy. Yes. In the, the past, when we've discussed certain bills, very often the Rhode Island Commission for the Deaf Staff will set up a letter that states our position on a bill, whether we've decided to support it or oppose it. So we could decide how to approach the bills that Ernest just mentioned to make sure that our advocacy or lobbying is most effective. Any questions about the bills that were just presented specifically? Any recommendations about how we should move forward on any of those issues? I see everybody is being quiet tonight. So I'm wondering, I, uh, Caroline. Um, you know, I, I just saw these for the first time. So I'm wondering if we can all get a copy of them, of what Ernest presented to us um, so that we can talk about it after having contemplated it a little bit. I don't really think I can have a, an intelligent conversation right now. That makes sense. Okay. I think the Commission on Disability actually has a legislative committee that works on reviewing bills that are in the process that relate to disability. And they then bring those forward to their board with recommendations about whether they should be opposed or supported. And I'm wondering if it's something we would want to consider. What's the best way that we could improve our process? Because a lot of times we have these during a meeting, it's a lot of information to process. And I'm thinking that if we had a committee that could really go into it in depth, do more research and then bring a recommendation back to the commission, that might be most effective. I, sorry, go ahead, Ernest. I agree with you, Tim. It might be an ad hoc legislative committee. It might become permanent, but well, maybe not permanent, but at least be assigned between January and June of every year and continue for six months because from July to January, it's not an active legislative season. So we would not need to have the um, 
you know, the, the committee meeting during that time, but it'd be nice to have a, some sort of an ad hoc committee because there are so many things on our plate right now. It's very difficult with COVID and all of the things in the office and then the things that are happening in the state and now the legislature. I know that they do have the Commission on Disability reviewing those and we have set up a lot of different groups, but I think it would benefit us a great deal to have a committee that could really focus on the legislative process and bring back recommendations for us to be able to discuss so that we would be more aware, more knowledgeable, that they had gone into in depth on this a little bit more. The committee would be able to even get some feedback from the community about how they felt about certain bills and whether or not we should support those. Instead of depending on just one person, we could get some community involvement and whatever the bills are that relate to disability, deaf and hard of hearing people in Rhode Island, it'd be very nice to have a legislative committee that could actually go out to the community and get that feedback from the general public. Thank you, Ernest. I think Massachusetts Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing has a statewide advisory council and they're called SAC, State, Statewide Advisory Council. And they have another, they have a legislative task force within that or next to that. I'm not aware a lot of what their process is, but the stakeholders then are represented from all these different organizations. They come together on the Statewide Advisory Council and they have more public input. They give advice to the commission from those stakeholder points of view. And they have this legislative subcommittee, a legislative task force. So I'm wondering if we could explore a little bit more about what would be the best approach to be most effective and something we could do ongoing. If there's more comments about that specifically, because I, at this point, don't know what to do in the near future. We only have two months left for the fiscal year and the legislature is only considering these bills in the very short term. Yes, Betsy. I like Carolyn's idea of getting copies of just these bills and talking about them next time. And that's what we do this year. Um, I think for next year, I, I'd like, you know, we have quite a few commissioners not here tonight. I'd like it when we have a fuller meeting to talk about, you know, possibly a new committee or what to do next year. Very good, Betsy, yes. If people agree with that, Ernest can email the commission copies, the, the sheets that were just sent out with the bills. And Ernest is saying, I'll do that for sure. I will. Those could be distributed to the commissioners and then we could put it on the agenda for next time. And there might still be time in the legislative season. That May meeting only leaves maybe a month, but we could still have some time to voice our opposition or support of those bills. And that might still benefit the deaf community if there aren't any other comments, um, I'm going to I'm going to hold off on the discussion, and we'll have Ernest send out the um, papers that he just showed us, and then people can bring that up at the next meeting for discussion after you've had a little bit more time to be able to process that. We can talk about it more in depth. So let's take a break, but there was one more piece of un one more piece of unfinished business from the last time. We know that we're still in an emergency situation regarding COVID. And I didn't know if there were any, I'd like to open it up for people who have an urgent thing that they want to discuss related to COVID specifically. If not, we'll go to break and we'll take uh, five minutes. Is there any concern that people want to raise or share related to vaccinations, related to 
um, work that's been affected by COVID, um, ways that we could support the community. Anything specifically COVID related at this moment that people would like to share with the other commissioners? If not, then let's go to break. Let's take five minutes and we'll be back here at 7.14 p.m. and then move on to new business on the agenda. Five minutes and then back, 7.14. I hope everybody had a good break. It is 7.15. If people could just open their videos briefly so that I know everybody's back and then we'll start the meeting. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> good, good to see everyone. Great, thank you. We're ready to get going again. So we're back on record here at 715 and we're into new business. Sorry, I was I lost my place here. I've got the screen with the new business. So Ernest. You're asking us to approve new members to the Tech Access and Telecommunications Relay Services Committee. And we wanted to know if there were any commissioners interested in that um, Telecommunications Relay Services Committee, TRCS, SC, excuse me. So you spoke about the four names of the people who are already interested, who are from different commissions and et cetera. Yes, Ernest is saying. And we might want to hold off until the next time when we have more commissioners here. I'm thinking so if these, you know, if there's no huge concerns, we could at least vote those four people in and we could hear a motion to talk about those four people and then and then if there's any commissioners who are interested in the slots that are available. So I'd be willing to entertain a motion. And Ernest could repeat the names or maybe write them in the chat. That might be, that might be useful. Yes, Ernest is saying, I will. I'm going to write the names of the four people who are already on that committee or I mean that we want approved for that committee. Yes. And that'll also help Betsy Beach because she's writing the notes. And while Ernest is typing the names into the chat, I'd like to open it up for any commissioners who might be interested in joining that committee. Are there any people who at this point are interested? Maybe one of you will volunteer. Okay, very good. So they're in the chat now. We have the four names of the people who are interested in being on the committee from these different commissions or from the general public. Ernest, I think you're all set, right? I don't know what our next step is right now. So let's hold on until Ernest is. So you can see the four names, yes? Betsy? Uh, you're muted still. 
I'll make a motion that we approve the four names in chat that Ernest has given us uh, to be on the Tech Access um, Video Relay Service Committee. Okay. And is there anyone who will make a second to Betsy's motion? I second. Uh, perfect. Carolyn Obrecht is seconding. So now I'm opening it up for discussion. If anybody would like to make a comment about the motion that's now on the floor. If no discussion, we can move forward to the vote. I'll give you a count of three. So if we could vote in favor, open your camera and give us a thumbs up. And obviously if you're opposed, thumbs down. I see four so far. Okay, five with Bunmi. Is there anyone opposed or abstaining? We have five commissioners. Ah, Brett Hayes hasn't voted, but I don't know if he's abstaining or if he's in opposition, but I haven't seen Brett. He, I think we can move. Oh, here's Brett. Hi, sorry, my wife just came home. Um, yeah, yeah, I passed the motion. Very good, thank you, Brett. So we have six votes, great. So the motion passes. We've approved those four people to be on that committee. And I don't know if there are any commissioners who are here. We need to have one deaf, one hard of hearing and one hearing. I don't know if anybody who's here would be interested in joining that committee. Yes, Betsy. Yeah, why are there more commissioners required for this committee than for the other ones? Because the other ones only needed one commissioner to be on the committee. This committee, it, it requires three. That seems like a lot. Ernest is saying, I'm following what the policy and procedure says, and it says three commissioners when I looked it up. So the policy or the law is, the, are you referring to Ernest? Oh, I'm sorry, it's in the law. It says established as a general law, 21283, and it says requires three commissioners. That is a lot. I see two listed for other, other committees, but with this one with the tech access and uh, video relay, it's saying three. And how often does that meet? Just once a year? Ah, yes, once a year. Oh, once a year. Maybe somebody would be willing to have a committee that you're only meeting once a year. And we're gonna be meeting with the ATL committee and they meet four times a year. So we usually meet nine to 10 in the morning and then the meeting would happen right after that from 10 to 11. But this particular committee would only meet once a year. So Tim is saying, would there be anybody interested who is here tonight volunteering? Um, and you can think about it and give us that information next time. And Ernest is saying, I see here in parentheses, it says, a hearing commissioner or a stakeholder. So it has to be either a stakeholder or a hearing commissioner. For that particular one, it says the three public chairs, it says public chairs. Well, that's interesting. During the 90s, I remember it was very important to, as a topic about 
relay and everybody was monitoring it. it was a huge issue but i think things have changed because now it's really being governed by the federal level the vrs is funded by federal and i think our priorities we were not as interested in it but this law dates back from then so that's where we're 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 so worried about the monitoring and i don't think people in actuality are as much anymore but we can hold this for the next meeting because people who are not here we have two new commissioners who weren't able to be here tonight. Maybe people could think it over. They could decide if they're interested, even before the next meeting, you could contact Ernest and express your interest. And certainly we'll discuss it at the next meeting. So the four people who are on the committee now, I'll contact them and let them know that the commission approved them. So they could start to at least, those four would be officially on the committee because we've been, they've been approved. So we can at least move forward with them. So thank you. Tim saying, yes. And if, if there aren't people coming forward within this commission, we can move on to the next stop, topic in the uh, new business. So the commissioners, the people on the board, we had our retreat. We met four times, I believe. It was four meetings in the month of March. And we, we had a really good uh, discussion. We got to have some interaction with each other, get to know each other better. And we wanted to talk about strategic planning and how we could continue the process into the next fiscal year. FY22 starts July 1st of 2021 and goes until June 30th of 2022. And it'd be nice if we could start that process now talking about at least our priorities, the three top issues that we identified for this upcoming time. We did brainstorm a little bit during the retreat and threw out some top concerns. One of them I remember was related to interpreting services. And we have set up an ad hoc committee to address interpreter referral. So we're working on that. That could become one of our priorities. Another one I remember related to diversity and inclusion and the Rhode Island Commission, the commissioners and the office staff. We have two commission available, two seats I think still available and we re could recruit people from a more diverse background to join the commissioners. We were talking about setting up a committee to do some outreach with the BIPOC community and talk about an action plan for more equity, um, diversity and inclusion, and to make sure that we had those voices centered. And also we were talking about how we could be more effective running our meetings every, every month, the committees are meeting in between the board meetings and whether the different committees could have access to the staff at the office. I think those were the three that were brought up. I may be incorrect. And if any of the other commissioners have a different understanding or can add to that, those were the three that, that I remember coming up from the retreat. Am I correct? If there's anything that people would like to discuss uh, about those top priorities or any comments that people would like to throw out. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, I remember the, the first two priorities, the interpreter referral and the diversity. I didn't remember that uh, the third one that you mentioned Oh, you got muted. You got muted, Betsy. You said you didn't remember the third one that. Yeah, I, I think, it, yes, oh, some, somehow I got muted. The third one that you mentioned, Tim, about uh, committee, our committees having access to staff and there being, um, you know, some interaction there. I didn't remember that one as well. But I remember the first two. Um, and I think the next agenda item, which is 
to talk about increasing diversity on the commission, if we did go to that, we would be doing the second item that we, we discussed during, during the retreat. I think we also, we did discuss about legislation and how we could improve more community involvement with legislation and advocacy. Um, I'm not sure we made an official decision on that, but it was a common theme that many people were feeling um, and mentioned. So it was one of our, our highest voted in our discussion priorities. Ernest, do you have the documentation of that vote that the board took during the retreat? No, no, I didn't receive it. I'll have to ask Shane for that. And then if you don't mind, I'll get it emailed. Um, I don't know if, if Shane said he was going to send out a survey. I didn't see it. So let me reach out to Shane about that survey and the reports of our discussions. And I'm sure Shane will share that with us. I did receive something from Erin Frito. Yes, the notes that she took during the retreat. Um, you know, remember all of us put down information and then we were voting on various priorities. Do we don't have that information? No, I'll have to reach out to Shane for it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So how do we continue this process and discussion about our priority topics um, within the next fiscal year 2022 and starting in July 1st. Do we want us, I know we have another meeting in May and then June, so we have two more months left in this fiscal year. So I wonder if we should try to finish and make those goals before officially the end of this fiscal year is over. Any thoughts on that? Um, sorry, try to figure out Boon Me and then uh, Betsy. Oh, both of you popped up at the same time on my screen. Uh, who would like, Betsy, would you like to go first? Yeah, I think we had started a good discussion on this with Shane. So I would like to see his notes and then continue. I agree though, that it would be good to pinpoint maybe a small number of things in the next two months before the new fish, fiscal year starts, maybe choose two or three goals. Boon me. did you also wanna make a comment? Yes, um, I agree with Betsy that we should, um, for the few months that we have left, we should focus on maybe two or three, um, especially I remember um, Holly, um, bitterly explain how difficult it is for only one interpreter referral at the commission. Um, so if, if we want to focus on maybe hiring, that was their main, um, um, everybody's goal at that time, at that retreat, that we should try and see if they can hire one more um, full-time uh, interpreter referral um, at the commissioner's office, at the um, at, at the state office, so I think uh, that should be that was actually our number one number one goal. Thank you. Thank you. So, regarding what we could do. Um, if we can get all of Shane's notes and then send them out to everyone to give everyone some time to peruse them and think about them before we return. And then we can think about how we can be more productive and look at what our top goals would be um, and prioritize from there. 
I think most of us you know, have mentioned that we might limit to three, but I think we could potentially talk about two to four. Um, if you're all good with that, uh, then we can move on further to the next new business topic. And, oh, Ernest? Uh, Bethany told me that we actually do have the recording of the retreats. Um, we have the recording. So if you're interested, I can also send out that recording. Uh, it's not public to be shared, but it could be shared that recording within um, the commissioners. It is a two hour, two or three hour video, but you can watch the recording uh, and look at what we discussed at that point. So we do have the recording, but I will also um, get Shane's email and then you can choose which you would prefer. Thank you. So moving on to the next point. Now we're moving on to C in new business. Talking about equity and inclusion, let me go ahead and read it. My screen is a little bit overlapping. I wanted to make sure I could see it. it was to discuss the commissioner working in related to equity and inclusion in a way that equity and inclusion and action plan, public communications, events, meetings, resource groups, recruiting commissioners, committee members to ensure there are diverse backgrounds, celebrations, awards, recognitions, and various other efforts for the commissioners. So we really want to ensure diversity and inclusion. So with that, at our past meeting, we had talked about a committee. I wanted to bring the discussion back here again to get a little bit more in depth of a discussion on how we should proceed as one of our top priorities that we talked about during our retreat. And I know there's currently a lot of things going on around the United States regarding this particular topic. And it should be an ongoing effort, um, not only during specific moments where the topic becomes um, more visible, but it should be an ongoing topic. Ernest, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly, Tim, you're right. We really want to see this be a continuous thing, not when it becomes a hot topic and then it kind of fades from view, That's as it has happened in the past. You know, uh, specifically talking about the Asia Pacific Islanders community as well, and the public feelings around that. So making a decision of, I'm going to be doing a vlog tomorrow, uh, just, giving out some information specifically on the Asia and Pacific Islander community that there should be a welcoming and inclusion and let that discussion and people open up about that topic and, and share how we can take steps and how we can assist the community and really try to, to empower and engage people. I know Rhode Island has a lot of immigrants in the community, and there's a lot of people from the Asia Pacific background, Pacific Islander background, and I really want to give them a, a platform and a table to, to discuss these issues and a forum that they would be welcome to join and to have that discussion. So should we, and then from there, ask, should we establish a committee? How, what is the best person, is there a commissioner from this particular community, or um, how we can assist and make changes and make sure we're meeting the needs of a high quality life and whatever is needed in a legislative process as well. So from the Asia Pacific and Islander community, um, often there, there can be an ignored group as well as um, the deaf community has that feeling as well. So really wanting to give that attention and in Rhode Island, being the only deaf and hard of hearing agency that has established a statement um, for the BIPOC community, historically, a lot of those issues there, um, those statements and vlogs 
I think we did that about two or three months ago. We made some vlogs and statements about that here, very much in support of the community. If you need anything, let us know. We're here to provide services. But unfortunately, we're the only agency that did that in the state. No other state made a public statement to that effect, which was very shocking to me, and that we were the only state, that, state agency that did that. I know there was another deaf and hard of hearing uh, community in another state. Uh, there was a mother there that has twins, uh, and there was a shooting that the police um, had said something about a shooting to a, a young child. And the mother, the mother had videoed that the interpreter, well, there was a lot of trauma that happened. It was a very big thing on the news in the deaf and hard of hearing community that happened recently. So that com community for the deaf and hard of hearing wanted to establish something and make an uh, open announcement and wanting to see change. But really from there, looking around, we only saw that Rhode Island was the only other one that made a public statement, which says a lot. And there was a feeling of limited information being shared. And so we really want to establish as a state agency level that openness to the BIPOC community, but as well to the Asia and Pacific Islander community. So we want to open that dialogue um, without the political um, divisions or anything like that. We just want to make sure that that door is open, that there's access and their voice has a place at the table to share what is going on in the community, what the needs are, and that we're here and willing to, to listen and support them as needed and make the steps that we need. And then from there, ask what, what is needed, maybe a committee, maybe something else, but we have something, a uh, place for the BIPOC community. Um, and we're, that's moving forward, but that's, unfortunately, that's the, we're the only one that have done that, the only state agency. Thank you very much for that comment. I'm wondering, in your consideration, should we go ahead and approve the establishment of a committee, meaning that we would approve that moving forward, um, we could then develop a vision for it. And then the vision and goals at that point, we would work together with people in the BIPOC community and the Asia Pacific Islander community. And then from there, talk about how we could move forward with that, if that's a good way um, for involvement. But we could go ahead and establish the committee just to start a small, um, just to start that ball rolling. What do you think? It's me again. Um, I think it'd be really nice to start a forum first to do a general questioning of the community. I'm going to release that vlog tomorrow but also we could just talk about a date and time to have people come and express their thoughts and feelings. I think a starting a committee is great, but I think to, to first get the general interest of the community and see if, oh, so they can see that we're working for them and that we really wanna invest time in their community. So I think if we can establish um, something that says that we're, we're moving towards that goal and then by starting with a forum, then from there we can go. Um, like you said, to start that ball rolling. Um, I would like to have that um, discussion forum first because I'm, I'm sure many feel often ignored or they might feel uncomfortable sharing with that at this time. But if we start building their confidence, a forum where we're, we're listening and we're, we're building that relationship, because right now our, we don't have a relationship with this particular community and to be, really be able to empower and give them an opportunity to feel that in the future things might be better. So I would say that we first would do a forum and see how it goes from there. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, and then second, Carolyn. Oh, oh, who's going first? Oh, <laughs> I think Betsy was first and then Caroline. Betsy? 
I agree with Ernest. I think we should identify a group of BIPOC people who um, want to meet together and then, um, you know, have that relationship and have maybe some of those folks on the committee before we start a committee that's mostly white. Carolyn? So oh, I, I agree with Betsy. I, I do not want to see a committee that's mostly white that's talking about diversity. Um, but I do think that as we're recruiting for two empty commissioner seats, we could really emphasize that we're looking for diversity and that that's, those are people we would really encourage to apply. And if they have any questions or wanna reach out to any of the commissioners, that we'd be open to talking with them about what this commission is so that it would be a, a friendlier kind of application process. Mm -hmm. So I think what Carolyn Obrecht mentioned there is really important. And, and Ernest, uh, you were talking about a vlog. Is it something that you've already created this vlog or could you also mention in this vlog, it's gonna to be tomorrow. You could also mention tomorrow. Oh, so you haven't made it yet. You could mention in this vlog that we have two commissioner seats available and we hope that the community is welcome to apply for that um, and to be in contact with us for that purpose. Okay, so do we feel that we should not go ahead at this point and start a committee, but that we should begin a discussion with the community? And if they are in support of this idea and are interested in being involved, then we could potentially in May have this discussion and establish a committee at that point. Uh, are there any other commissioners that haven't commented yet that would, would like to comment on your viewpoint of this issue? Not seeing any at this point, no comments? Okay, so I think if we're not seeing any objection at this point, then Ernest, go ahead and make that vlog tomorrow. And he will talk about the establishment of a forum and that we potentially, we have two commissioner seats and we would love to see more involvement and want to develop an action plan from there. Um, if any of you feel that's good, should we move ahead with that plan? I don't know if we need a formal, formal motion on this. Do you think we need a formal motion? <laughs> no. Okay. So we can just go ahead, Ernest, with that tomorrow. Um, that's great. So moving on to point D, it's the last one. Uh, we have about 12 minutes left, but we can start a discussion about our role as commissioners and all the committees. I know now we've established we have five committees and soon potentially we're going to have six committees, maybe even seven because of the legislative committee that was mentioned, and now the equity and diversity as well. So we're having a number of committees started, and I think we're starting to get spread thin. Um, and we want to make sure that we're still seeing the results. And so having this discussion of how to ensure that with the establishment of our priorities and those strategic priorities, that the committees are working in support of our established priorities. 
Um, so that would mean we want to be more effective with how we're meeting and then bringing that information back to the commissioners for a discussion and votes as we move forward in a more results focused way. So we would want to develop what could be called a, he froze. Looks like he yeah. lost internet connection. I don't know, maybe Carol and you, oh, he's coming back, okay. Okay, I thought the interpreter froze, but I guess I was the one that froze. So what was the last thing that I said? Um, let me just back up a little bit again. Um, so I think, was I on E? Maybe someone could help me. Do you mind letting me know what the last thing I said before I froze? So, Betsy, you go ahead. Yeah, it's in the transcript, Tim, if you open it up. And you said um, you want to uh, the, make sure the committees are working on our established stri strategic priorities in a focused way. And we could develop what, what could be called a, and then you froze. So we don't know what you're gonna call, what we could develop. Okay. Um, so we could establish what would be called a charge and I don't mean a fine or something legal, but more of a responsibility charge um, that we could establish for you know, the ad hoc uh, committee we, for interpreters, we established a particular goal, um, what exactly they were uh, created, what are they producing, a timeline, um, membership, all of those things clearly laid out. And if we could do that for all of the committees to have a clear charge, then our strategic priorities would be reflected in the charge of the committees and would thus be supporting those strategic priorities. So each one of the meetings and that they have, they would be working towards those same goals. So there might be something that was recognized as the committee finds and would bring it back to the commissioners so that there's two-way communication going back and forth, both from the committee to the commission and the commission to the committee. So we want to make sure that as the board is discussing and voting, that we're doing it in a more effective and results-oriented way and we're seeing things happen. So I think that's something that if we want to discuss a little bit at this at this time, I don't know if we would actually finish that discussion tonight or if that would continue into our meeting in May and June. But I was just wondering at this point what your perspective would be. So I, I think that sounds like an interesting idea, Tim. You said that uh, with potential for seven committees, we are spread quite thin. And I agree with that. And I, and I wonder if some of our being quiet tonight is that we're all tired. Um, so what I would wonder is with seven committees, could we have fewer commission meetings so that people don't have so much meeting fatigue? Could we be more efficient? Which ties into one of our earlier goals, which is how to run our meetings more efficiently. Could we have fewer of them? Tim's saying that's a really good comment. Thank you. And I see Brad as well. And before, did Betsy want to make a comment? I don't know if you popped up before Brett, but Brett, why don't you go forward and then if Betsy wants to speak, she can come on. 
Yeah, um, I, I actually wanted to second Caroline comment. And it's funny, I thought, I don't know, maybe it's because of what happened with COVID. We started to plan out and think about having meetings on every other month, Kaden. And it's definitely a month that where we know we have to come back because of uh, legislation period or uh, with holiday. So um, I don't know if we wanted to start to think about that again. Thank you. I'll, I'll third it. I think once we've established, you know, perhaps one or two more committees, the tech access and the diversity, I think a lot of our charge can be done in those committees and that the commission meetings can be less frequent. So. Tim's saying good, thank you. And also, well, I was thinking when we have all those different committees meeting, sometimes they're not voting. They're not making certain decisions. They're, let's say, for example, they make a recommendation to the commission in their report. So they have to bring it back to the board. And then we discuss those and vote. And I'm thinking the committees themselves are doing collection of information, working with staff, identifying issues, what needs to be, uh, needs a needs assessment, what needs are out there in the community, identifying paths forward, perhaps advocating for certain changes or establishing certain projects, looking for grants, monitoring and reviewing legislation, each committee obviously has its own priorities and they have their own role, but then they have to bring that back to the board and we would, we would be voting on these things and it could be that we'd be more effective because we wouldn't need a full two hours. We would have their reports and we would act on those. There'd be proposals ready for voting and we could be more efficient. We don't need to have as much discussion if the committees have already done the homework for us. We could actually just move forward and vote and get a lot more results. What do people think about that? I think that sounds great. And board me? Yeah, I wanted to say that I, I think that's a very good idea. Great. I just got the three minute warning. And uh, if there are more comments related to this topic before we close tonight, um, if there aren't any, then we could move forward with um, the final wrap up. But if there is somebody who wants to speak, I'd like to give them the floor. Hearing none, our next section before we close is to receive any announcements or special um, information that you want to share. We want to give people time to share announcements, and then we'll officially close the meeting. Is there anything out there that people would like to make us aware of? If not, I'll adjourn the meeting at 7.58, two minutes early. <laughs> Yay. And if everybody could open up their videos so that we could all say goodbye. Thank you everyone for coming tonight and being part of this. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. There were some other people who are there in the meeting. I don't know if they're gonna open their videos, but okay. <laughs> Take care, good night.